to interact with, uh, with this group here. Uh, there, there really are a lot of links between what BIDS is doing and what BITS, this other in, uh, initiative I'm involved with, uh, is doing. So it's great to, to connect and share. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, issues that I think might interest you in economics related to promoting research transparency. I'm really going to think a lot about and discuss um, pre-specification of research hypotheses. So I'll start with a little bit of background, where I'm coming from, and then talk about some potential applications of um, pre-specification of research hypotheses um, as a tool for achieving greater transparency in economics research. The, the starting point for all this is a growing recognition in the social sciences, not just in econ, but in psychology, political science, and other fields that um, there are some pretty pervasive problems with the research that, that's being produced. Um, there's more and more evidence that uh, whole literature is maybe uh, full of false positives, or there's a fear that, that lots of results that we think of as solid results are really just, just false positives. There's a lot of evidence that, that data mining goes on. Um, there's also a really great new study that's the Franco et al. Uh, 2014 study in science. It was, it was a really unusual study because they were able to um, keep track of all the different social scientists who had gotten access to a particular data set. It was a, really a data set that the, the researchers themselves helped design. They got to add questions to online surveys. Um, and uh, Franco et al. followed up with all the researchers that had been involved in this multi-year project and got information on their research results, whether they had statistically significant results or not, what their, whether their findings were expected or not, et cetera. And they found this really striking fact, which was null results. Results that were well-powered, but not statistically significant, very rarely got published, very rarely appeared in the published literature. Significant results almost all got published. So if you extrapolate from the findings of Franco et al. to the rest of our social science research literatures, and perhaps this holds outside the social sciences, uh, we'll, we should really be concerned about, about the bodies of literature we're, we're producing. Those are the problems. We're figuring out new ways of, of diagnosing these problems. But I'm going to discuss today one possible way of beginning to solve some of these problems and discuss how widely it can be applied. So uh, to, to sort of lay out a, a set of possible solutions, I was uh, involved in a paper that came out in Science a couple of years ago. They talked about three different sets of approaches that might improve transparency and reproducibility in social science research. So the three are listed up here. Uh, one is what's called disclosure, really increasing the reporting requirements for researchers, uh, really setting up uh, or trying to set up a norm of full disclosure of research designs, full disclosure of data. Uh, so that's one. The second one, which is related, is uh, shifting norms in favor of open data and materials. Again, in many research fields, people's data, researchers' data, remains their own and is rarely shared with the research community. That's changing now in a lot of fields. I think the world is changing. It's definitely changing in economics. But for instance, in psychology, it's still pretty rare to share your data sets. Uh, in medical research, it's still quite rare, partially for privacy reasons. Um, so open data and materials uh, is, is valuable to allow people to replicate results and sort of build on existing research. The third type of approach or potential solution we talk about in this article from a couple of years ago is pre-registration of research hypotheses. And that's what I'm going to focus on mainly today. The idea here is, you know, when we think of science, when we think of research, we really think of pre-registration type uh, approaches to research hypotheses. We think that the researchers out there with a clear idea of what they're going to test, they go and they get their data, they run their experiment, whatever they're going to do, and then they compare their results to, to what they planned. In reality, Research doesn't proceed this way in many cases. Sometimes it does, but it often doesn't. People get their hands on data. They mine the data. They look for correlations. They look for different patterns. Maybe they've run 20 different hypotheses on this data. And maybe at the end of the day, they only report that one that's statistically significant. That's the one that gets published in a paper. That's a big problem. That's part of the reason why we think there may be a lot of false positives out there. In, in research literature. So the idea here is if only we could get folks to publicly register their research hypotheses beforehand, A, we're going to know all the tests that were run. So we're going to get a better sense of what results are missing in the literature, unpublished. And when people run their statistical tests, we're going to have a better sense of what they mean. If I've run hundreds of tests and I only report one of them, the one with the smallest p-value, that p-value isn't that meaningful. 
there's a sort of multiple inference problem in the background that's just not being dealt with in any sort of serious way. Pre-registration of hypotheses could help us deal with that. We could lay out what we want to test. We could lay out how we're going to deal with the multiple testing problem. We can try to solve it. OK, so, so what does this mean in practice? And I'll tell you what it's starting to mean in economics. So in economics, we actually are beginning to have a, a, an approach for, for pre-registering research hypotheses. I'm going to tell you what people are doing so far, and then think about whether we can extend this into new realms of research. That's really the goal of the talk today. So what would it? What would pre-registration look like? Well, researchers, myself, I have a research question. I could post them in a publicly available registry that could be queried. So if anybody else is interested in this research topic, they could kind of figure out I was interested in this. I've been running, uh, you know, collecting data on this, on this issue. You could imagine that that sort of plan or that research hypothesis document could be very detailed. It could be very sparse. And one of the things I'll come back to in my discussion today is there's still a lot of debate within economics and other social sciences about how much one should pre-register, how detailed one should be. Should it be a one-pager with the broad outline of what you plan to do, or, or a 50-page document, step by step, mechanism by mechanism, all the way through? I'll come back to that later on. Um, in some sense, it's second order, that debate about how detailed we should be, because almost no one's doing it at all right now. So even just getting that two-pager out with, like, I'm kind of interested in this question, that would be a huge step forward. So let me tell you about an effort, which is the new American Economic Association registry. It's, it's called socialscienceregistry.org. So I guess they had a kind of, maybe there's an imperialistic ambition there to make it social science-wide, not just economics. Uh, it was only founded a few years ago, so less than three years ago. It's called the RCT registry, Randomized Controlled Trial uh, Registry. And part of the impetus for um, establishing this registry were all the concerns I was talking about before. The fear that there was a lot of research that was disappearing, et cetera. Uh, and economists got together and voted through our association to set up a registry so we could have a, a kind of uh, a central, uh, central registry to store this information. It's a nice website, very user friendly. And the thing that's been very impressive for us in economics is just how quickly it's taken off. I was involved in some early discussions uh, about the registry. I've been uh, through bits uh, trying to promote the, the pre-registration of research hypotheses. It was really unclear when the registry was launched three years ago if people would, would participate, but they are. There's already over 600 studies registered in the last few years. Um, numbers are rising rapidly. Some of these are older studies. So the registry has two goals. One is to allow people to pre-register hypotheses. The other is folks who have existing studies, existing randomized control trials in economics, are encouraged to register uh, on, the, on the RCT registry. So we have the complete body of literature basically there, you know, registered all in one, in one place. So it's a combination of both. But the numbers are rising. So you know, every month there's more uh, registrations here from the start in 2013 until uh, earlier this year. And the numbers per month are rising too. So the trend is, you know, this is really accelerating. Uh, in terms of, of registrations. And I will say that in my own field, I'm an economist, I'm a development economist. I work on international development issues. Development economics has been the subfield within economics that has done the most field experiments and randomized control trials of any subfield of economics. We, we got into it early on, we teach our students how to do them, and now it's spreading sort of throughout economics. Within development economics, in the last few years, it's really become the norm to register your work put up pre uh, uh, hypothesis documents, et cetera, before studies are analyzed. So the norms are starting to shift in my field for experiments very quickly. So this is a, a real success. In a few years, we went from no registry in economics, almost no pre-registration of hypotheses, to just hundreds of these studies coming up a year. Big change in a small amount of time. You know, the, the data here, going back to the issue I raised before about the level of detail that's expected. Um, you can put up a pretty sparse registration right now. The AEA registry was set up and was meant to be pretty light touch, pretty low demand, you know, to impose low demands on researcher time. So you can basically list your main outcomes, the broad design you're going to use, the country you're working in, a little bit on the sample. But you don't, to register your study, you don't need to lay out every single statistical test you plan to. Carry out. There's an option to do so. There's an option to attach documents with very detailed analysis plans if you want, but it's still light touch. And I think part of the reason they did this was 
to make sure people weren't scared off. They wanted to get everybody in the system, in the registry, even if it's at a minimal level, to change the norm. And um, then maybe over time, norms will shift towards, towards more demanding um, uh, sort of standards. But you know, it's easy. You click on it, start with the name of the trial. In 15 minutes, you can register, register a study. So this is, <clears throat> this is a success story. What are the benefits that I think we might see from this move towards pre-specification in economics? I'm going to survey this quickly for like five minutes and then tell you about this whole other realm of research in economics that isn't being pre-registered where I think these norms could be usefully applied. But let me just give you the, this is like the win, the success story. RCTs are being registered online. Why is this good? A, I mentioned the Franco et al. study, all this research that just disappears. We know is conducted. It just never gets published. It's never circulated. If everybody's registering their research hypotheses ex ante, that research isn't going to disappear. It's going to be registered. I'll be able to search on uh, you know, a particular labor, labor economics topic or a particular health economics topic and get the 20 studies that were registered on that topic, even if they were never published. So that's really good. It rounds out the body of evidence, A. B, it's going to reduce the risk of biased reporting of results. So if I lay out in advance, I'm planning to look at a particular health uh, outcome. I'm, I'm interested in the effect of a particular treatment on high blood pressure. And I registered that. But when I got the data, I didn't find anything on high blood pressure. Well, maybe without registration, I would sort of like not report high blood pressure. Maybe I found that it affected uh, weight loss. You know? I looked at 50 different health outcomes. 49 just had no effect. There was this one relationship between this treatment and weight loss. Sure, that should be reported. But if I write my paper as if all along I was planning to look at weight loss, it's just a really misleading paper. It's a really misleading piece of research. And maybe the high blood pressure result never gets reported. If I'm registered publicly, and I go on the record saying, I think the, you know, the hypothesis I'm interested in, my primary outcome is high blood pressure, someone's going to ask, like, what was that high blood pressure result you said you, you, know, you were going to run? You can say, oh, it was a zero. But there's at least some accountability. Without the registry, it's hard to even know what people are doing. So that's a big advantage of, uh, of the registry. Closely related to point number two, p-values have a lot more meaning when I know how many tests have been run. If I know you were going to run these five tests, I can adjust for multiple inference across those five tests. But you know, if I don't know what you plan to do, maybe you ran 500 tests. And I have no idea what statistical significance means if I don't know how many tests you ran. We have corrections for this stuff. But I don't, if I don't know what the number of tests are, I just have nowhere to start. So that's another advantage. <coughs> it makes open data more effective in the sense that uh, if stuff is registered, it may point me towards the data set that's out there. You know, if I post my data somewhere, but no one knew what I planned to use it for, or uh, no one even knew the study existed, they're never going to find that data set. If there's a centralized registry where everybody's posting their research hypotheses, I'm going to find out about more data. I'm going to be able to build on existing research better. Another big advantage of a registry. Wow, registry is just sounding awesome. This is, just, this is sounding so good. Um, a side benefit, and one that people don't typically talk about much, which I think, as someone who's been writing pre-analysis plans and pre-registering hypotheses now for the last six, seven years, um, <coughs> a big benefit is it forces you to really think through your research in advance of doing it. So you're planning your data collection, or you're planning your analysis, and um, we have endless debates now about what, what is the right econometric specification? What is the right statistical test in a given setting? And we do our due diligence to figure that out before registering it in a plan, because that's pretty serious. The world's going to see that was our plan. You can't wing it as much, which a lot of researchers do. They get data. They're not sure exactly how they're going to use it. They're not, you know, sometimes when you think things through, you get the right data. When you think things through, you sort of structure your tests in a better way, et cetera. So, you know, I was, I was uh, presenting a related talk to this a couple of years ago down at Stanford, and there were, there were folks down there who, um, who do lab, lab experiments in the social sciences. And folks, you know, some of these folks were saying, well, you know, I like to be able to wake up in the morning and just like with a new idea and just like run the lab that day. Just like, ah, oh, I want to run this lab. I'm going to get these subjects in today and, and run a lab. That's pretty exhilarating, I think, as a researcher to wake up in the morning, have your cup of coffee, and just have a new idea. But, you know, I might suggest you like take a few hours and think about it before you use all these resources to, to, to run a test, right? So, so again, there's something a little more deliberative, a little more careful about writing a plan. 
there may be others. Again, I'm not sure how interactive we want to be. You know, in, in a, maybe another setting, we'd all be, everybody would be shouting things out. Should we? Let's do it. I'd love to. I'd love, I love. I want questions. I just want to know about the mics. Yeah. Please don't wait. Go for uh, it. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if it's recording. It's on. Okay. So, so going back to you use the word pre-registration. Yeah. Rather than publishing. Yep. With with sort of with at least peer review, and maybe yeah. more more darkly, you know, publishers lock. Mm -hmm. uh, th that sort of a situation. That's a, so you're interested in that distinction between the publishing it versus pre-registering it. Yeah, w you you could imagine applying a, p a publishing point of view to, or use the word at least, uh, to this process for, of hypotheses yep. with with peer review at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or or have the agenda of working it the other way and and getting to a more open publishing. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, regime. I'm, I'm going to come back to related points, but I'll just say one thing, which in some fields, so in clinical trials, medical clinical trials, people often do publish their pre-analysis plans, their hypotheses documents. So that is something that is done in some fields. I will talk about exactly this notion, though, of getting your hypotheses peer-reviewed later on. I'll talk about what are called registered reports, which is a new publishing form that's taking off in now in psychology, there's a political science journal that's doing it, which allows folks to get their research hypotheses peer reviewed and accepted for publication before they even touch the data. So I'll come back to that because that's a kind of next step in some of these, these ideas. Exactly. So, you know, you make a, exactly. So the, in the grant process, we're already writing proposals, laying out our hypotheses. In some sense, we already do have these plans. But those are, are very rarely shared with the research community. They're sort of proprietary. The grant-making organizations don't publish them typically, unless they're funded. Um, so there, there are already things we're doing that are along the lines of what I'm saying, but it's not formalized. They're not put out there. They're, they're not, I guess what I'm, the big difference is they're not searchable by the research community. We're making them, but we're not putting them in a place where everybody can find them. And, and, and a registry makes them findable. Um, okay, so how about some concerns? <laughs> in this push towards pre-registration in economics, there's been a backlash, actually, within economics and other fields. There's a number of scholars who have been very vociferously arguing against pre-registration. There was a very senior scholar in my field in development economics, and I got an email from a friend literally just yesterday. This you know, distinguished scholar in my field was giving a seminar at his, at his department, and he said, apparently, I hate pre-analysis plans. My model is my pre-analysis plan, meaning he has a theoretical perspective. So economists write down formal models. Those models have testable predictions. He's saying, look, I'm, like, here's my model. My model has predictions. If I run tests trying to figure out uh, you know, what a parameter estimate is in my model, my model's already constraining my behavior. I'm not data mining. I'm just basing everything off my model. My, the junior colleague that contacted me about this said, to the senior scholar, well, why didn't you pre-register your model then? If the model is everything, pre-register your model. Get it up there, make it public that that's what you want to test. If you don't do that, I have no idea that was the model you started with. You might have gone through three or four different conceptual frameworks before you hit on one that gave you results that you liked. So I'll come back to that as well. But there's this back and forth in economics where a lot of us who are doing field experiments, especially younger scholars, are registering. But, but there's a, a backlash, especially among more established scholars, I think. Um, one of the critiques that's made is, you know, if we have to pre-register, it's just going to stifle our creativity. You know, so many famous scientific findings were just done by chance. Someone stumbled across a pattern in the data. You know, the, you know, the discovery of penicillin. We could go on and on about these accidental discoveries that no one planned. There was no pre-analysis plan for them. Uh, are we going to lose that? Are we going to lose all that scientific progress if we start pre-registering? My own view on this is it's not either or. When we can pre-register and we have data coming online or an experiment coming online that allows us to pre-register, let's pre-register. Uh, there's always going to be tons of data, non-experimental data, other data floating around, historical data, retrospective data that people are going to be analyzing and looking at. And uh, maybe uh, these kinds of, of, of um, f you know, fortuitous discoveries are going to be more common. But it doesn't have to be either or. And I just want to put this slide kind of early on in the talk, because very often when we talk about pre-registration, people say, oh, God, if we start pre-registering, only pre-registered work will get published. That's not how it works. 
about 15, 20 years ago, in economics, people started doing field experiments. I was lucky enough to be in getting my PhD, and my advisor was one of the earliest economists doing field experiments, Michael Kramer. Um, and I started doing field experiments. So I was part of this wave of economists doing field experiments. And when we started doing them, we started hearing a lot of the same stuff. Oh my god, now that there are field experiments, those of us not doing experiments are just never going to be able to publish again. It's over. Experiments are just going to crowd out everything else. That hasn't happened. It's been 15 or 20 years now. And last we checked, there's some recent data, about 10% of papers in economics journals, leading economics journals, are experimental. Most papers are still observational. So it went from 1% to 10%. That's like a massive increase. The trend is going in that direction. But experimental work is still a subset of all work. Same thing in medical research, where clinical trials are very well established. The vast majority of papers in it, epidemiology, public health, et cetera, remain observational studies. So we don't have to think that just because registration is available and usable in some settings, nothing else is ever going to get published again. So again, I just want to kind of like, you know, uh, move beyond, uh, beyond that. The advantage of pre-specification is then we know sort of what, was, uh, what is being tested that was planned on ex ante versus what's more exploratory. And that's a really valuable distinction to know scientifically. Those are, those are different sorts of findings. The interpretation of p-values are different, et cetera. OK. All that was background long-winded 15-minute background. But what I want to really get to today is you know, the starting point was we've kind of gotten pre-registration to work for experiments in economics. How widely can we apply this approach? Can we go beyond experimental studies? In my view and in discussions with others working in economics interested in these issues, this is like the big open intellectual question in our field methodologically uh, around transparency. Is pre-registration, our pre-analysis plans just going to be confined to experiments, or could they be applied elsewhere? Well, one area beyond field experiments where they could very easily be applied is laboratory experiments. So people called experimental economists typically do lab work similar to psychology labs. Very few of them pre-register their, their experiments, but they really could, just like we do with field experiments. It's the same idea. They're planning. Uh, a lab, they're going to call in subjects, they know what the treatments are, they presumably have a research hypothesis there that they're, they're working with, they could register their work. There's been a lot of backlash from experimental economists, so a very distinguished experimental economist, Muriel Netterly at Stanford, um, says, you know what, pre-registering work in the lab is, is, is really a waste of time because labs are cheap and easy to replicate. It only costs a couple thousand dollars maybe to run a big lab. If I find something interesting, I can go back and do it again. Someone else can just very easily redo my lab. So when replication is really easy and cheap, maybe pre-registration is just superfluous. That's, that's her argument. And there's something to it compared to some of the field experiments we do in development economics. You know, we've been involved in multi-year field experiments in, I, I mainly work in sub-Saharan Africa, where the cost of the intervention is millions of dollars. You can't easily redo those experiments. That's pretty hard and expensive. A lab that costs $1,500 or $3,000, if it's a interest, sufficiently interesting result, people will replicate it. So she has, she has a point. That said, more and more lab data and lab work is being linked to field experiments these days in economics. More and more lab work is also being linked to the real world context. So for instance, some very interesting experimental economics work done at, at Berkeley here looked at how people played labs before and after the outbreak of the Great Recession. And behavior changed. People became selfish. People started acting in these really selfish and, and uncooperative ways after, I think, October 2008, when the market collapsed. You can't redo that real world experiment. That's a case where you might actually want a pre-analysis plan. So, so I think there are cases where pre-analysis plans will be useful in labs. There may be other cases where replication can solve a lot of problems. But so that, that's, that's another um, one area. The area I'm going to focus on, though, for the next 20 minutes, really the bulk of the talk, is going to be what I call perspective observational studies that are non-experimental. So what do I mean by perspective observational studies? Experiments are pretty much, by definition, perspective. Like, I'm planning the experiment so I can write down a plan. Presumably, I have a plan of what I'm going to do. I could register that. Observational studies with existing data, though, uh, are, are har it's harder to know when you've seen the data, if you've been mining the data before you register a plan. But prospective observational work is work that's not based necessarily on an experiment, but where I don't have access to the data yet. That's what I'm calling prospective uh, work. So for instance, 
In economics, very often we know there's going to be a policy change in the future. Right now in California, Jerry Brown just signed a bill into law, I think a week ago, two weeks ago, raising the minimum wage. So for the next five years, we know the minimum wage is going to go up to $15, maybe six years. It's going to go up to $15. That's a policy change that we know is going to happen. We can take advantage of that policy change to study the effect of minimum wage changes on the labor market. I'm going to come back to exactly this example in a few slides. I could write a pre-analysis plan now laying out how I'm going to exploit that policy change. It hasn't happened. I can't mine the data. I don't know what the data is going to look like in 2020. No, you know. That is perspective. This is a, I'm going to argue today, like the bottom line of my talk today is this is a realm where we could be doing a lot of pre-registration in economics and in the social sciences, but like no one is now, or almost nobody is right now. Another case, not just policy changes, in political science, future elections. We know when the election is going to take place. We you know, may have hypotheses about how particular things are going to affect voting outcomes, but the voting outcomes haven't been realized yet. And there's actually a case of some pre-specification in political science along these lines. Why isn't every political scientist who's studying election outcomes just pre-registering their hypotheses so we know they're not cherry-picking results? It seems very natural to do. Almost nobody is doing it right now. So there's this whole realm of activity in social science that's unregistered that could be just as easily registered as RCTs. And I'll talk about an early case, and basically an almost forgotten paper, this Newmark paper I'm going to talk about that does this, and, and talk about what, we've, what we can learn from, from it. OK, so beyond these big policy experiments, any time a new round of data is going to be released, we could be writing pre-analysis plans before it's released, before a census is released. PSID, sorry, I'm using economics terminology. This is the panel study of income dynamics, a multi-decadal scale longitudinal survey of American households. And every however many years, they come out with another round. Well, if there's been something interesting to study, why don't I just register my hypotheses before they release the round? I know exactly what variables are going to be in there, et cetera. Um, so, so, so that's what I'm calling for. Now, the current AEA registry is meant to be for RCTs, randomized controlled trials. But there are actually other platforms one could use to register a pre-analysis plan. So one is the Open Science Framework, which some of you may be familiar with, you know, put together by the Center for Open Science in Virginia. Um, they have a very flexible, you can, you can basically register and make public whatever you want, uh, point people to it, create a permanent URL, whatever, to make it pretty easy to find. And they're also trying to increase interoperability with the AEA registry. So my own view is the AEA registry, and that's part of the kind of point of this talk, is also just to make the case the AEA registry should be open to more than RCTs. It should be open to any perspective study where it's credible. You, you, know, you, could, you could register your and timestamp your hypotheses. Let me give you a few other examples. There's actually a, there's, there's other applications uh, that one can, uh, could, could, could use pre-registration for. Let me give you a few again. These are a, a bit econ specific. I'm going to try not to use too much jargon. If you have questions, you know, go ahead and ask. In a lot of macroeconomic research, researchers run calibrations. They have a model of the economy, the macroeconomy, and they subject this economy to different impulses, interventions, and they work through and see the effect of these sort of simulated experiments within the model on, say, economic growth. But there's a lot of choices and flexibility you know, in a particular model in which parameters you're going to choose. And those parameters are going to govern the outcomes. And there's a fear among those of us not in, in macro, and even among those in macro, that people, some researchers sometimes have a leeway to get the results they want by manipulating four or five parameters enough. That there's, there's basically a lot of degrees of freedom, is one way to put it, in these macro models. A macroeconomist who hasn't, say, gotten the latest data yet that they're going to use for one of these calibrations could go on the record and pre-register. These are exactly what I think of as the right parameter values for this model. I haven't seen the data that I'm going to like, use to generate predictions, but I'm on the record with these parameters. Here are the results. It'll reduce some of the, the fear that results are being rigged by, by researchers, just to be, to be frank. Very similarly, in some uh, economic models, which are called structural models, again, there's very uh, specific uh, mathematical functional forms imposed on behavior. They give you very specific predictions about economic behavior. These models tend to be quite complex and quite sensitive to parameter values. And again, there's a fear that you can get almost anything you want if you tinker enough with 
what the demand curve looks like, what cost curves look like, et cetera. Pre-specifying, going on the record with what you think of as the right parameters would really give people a lot more confidence in, uh, in your results. For people who are you know, doing Bayesian statistics, you know, there is a, a, a sort of degree of freedom there. You can make different assumptions about the prior distribution. Again, before the, I get the data I'm going to use in analysis, I could go on the record and pre-register what I think of as the right prior. No one can accuse me then of sort of you know, data mining based on you know, choosing a prior to get the result that I wanted based on the data if I haven't seen the data yet. So again, before you see the data, you can go on the record with a lot of your research decisions and it could give the research more credibility. So it doesn't just have to be experiments. Anytime you don't have the data yet, uh, you can do this. Okay. So let me discuss the Newmark paper for about 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. I, I see this paper, you know, I, I've been writing a review with Garrett Christensen, your guys' colleague here at BIDS. We've been writing a review on transparency and reproducibility issues in economics and trying to make sense of where this literature has come from. And, you know, really for decades there have been papers that have appeared, one or two here or there, and then kind of been forgotten or uh, trying to make the case for some of the practices we're talking about. Now there's more, I think, critical mass, more momentum. But an early milestone that's almost forgotten is this Newmark study from, I guess, 17, 17 years ago. It was ultimately published 15 years ago. To my knowledge, this was the first pre-analysis plan in economics. This is someone who got on the record about his research hypotheses. And he was studying minimum wage, the, the topic I was, I was talking about before. Do you, have, do you have a comment in the back? Yeah. yeah do you want to ask a question? The mic is here. Why don't you, why don't you use the mic? Um, I was wondering whether we can keep update our assumptions. Like when you're doing Bayesian, you know, prior has to be kept updated by you know existing literature or you know available data. Yeah. So, is it possible for researchers to you know update and change their assumptions when new data comes in or before data comes in? Before the data comes yeah. in. Yeah. So like you're saying when if you you're register doing... one document, could you then update it before the data comes in? Right. Oh, definitely. I would. I would think that would be the right thing to do. It, it shouldn't be that the pre-analysis plan is set in stone. If I register a set of ideas, I still don't have the data. I'm like, oh my god, I made a terrible mistake. You know, one of the first pre-analysis plans after Newmark, Newmark is the first, but there were a few pre-analysis plans written in 2009. I was involved in one of those projects. I think there were three of us in different groups that around that time started doing this in economics. And I think overall we did a good job. I mean, it was like, it was like a 60-page document, our pre-analysis plan. We had everything you know, really detailed to the exact covariates, exact outcomes, exact groupings into mean effects. I mean, we really spent forever putting it together. There was a hypothesis we forgot. We were studying a program in Sierra Leone that was providing assistance. You know about it. <laughs> you know this paper. So provides assistance to communities. But we forgot the most basic hypothesis, which was like, was the assistance from this program actually given to the villages? Like, we actually had data on, like, did the money arrive? Did they actually implement the program? Because we were just... All of our hypotheses were about the outcomes, right? And this just basic implementation hypothesis we forgot. So in the published paper, we're like, OK, we, this isn't in our pre-analysis plan. It's so obvious that you'd want to actually check that the money arrived before anything else. So we're adding it, mea culpa. So you know, our view is we, need to, we can't be you know, dogmatic and say, oh, you know, something that wasn't pre-specified could never be looked at. You just have to be clear about what was pre-specified and what you added. And we say in the paper, hey, if you don't want to consider this, don't consider it. That said, you probably want to know if the money arrived before studying anything. So our view is we need to iterate, improve over time. OK, let me, let me talk about this Newmark, uh, Newmark piece. So just like today, the, the minimum wage is a contentious, politically contentious issue. I think it was even more contentious probably 20 years ago uh, than it is today. And there was a literature, David Card and Alan Kruger were involved. David Card is here, my colleague at Berkeley. They had written a bunch of papers showing that, you know, you raise the minimum wage, there's basically no employment effects. That was their finding. They had a bunch of studies. Newmark and some other colleagues had written other papers with different data and different statistical approaches showing that when you raise the minimum wage, you get these negative employment effects, which is like the neoclassical economic explanation. Like you make labor expensive, people hire less labor. Everybody kind of agrees that's probably the right direction of the effect. But if it's minuscule and close to zero, who cares? If it's really big and negative, it matters a lot. So Newmark's findings were it's really big and negative. Card and Kruger's were at zero. It was very you know, contentious. And, and that's where this study kind of emerges. So this, uh, not to belabor it, but you know, the exist, these were just the existing estimates in the early 90s. There were some zero point estimates. There were some positive point estimates. Hey, you raise the minimum wage, employment goes up. There were a bunch of big negative point estimates. 
There were sort of estimates all over the place. And Card and Kruger, in uh, a study of theirs, uh, really argue very strongly that they thought there was a lot of publication bias. That you know, you basically saw lots of studies with really big estimates in both directions, with t statistics of exactly two, like just what you needed to get published, and sort of nothing in between. So it was like nothing null ever got published, only like big positive and negative effects on both sides. And it just seems so consistent with a really screwed up journal screening model. So they said, OK, we, you know, we, we've got to do better than this. So what ended up happening, and this is really a Berkeley story, so I'm glad to be telling it here. There was a journal, Industrial Relations, which is a labor economics journal. The editor was here at Berkeley, is still here at Berkeley, David Levine in Haas School of Business. He was the editor. In conversation with Alan Kruger uh, about this exact topic, they said, you know, there's got to be a way to get around these publication bias effects and these author effects. And they came up with this idea of saying, why don't we tell people to write down what they're going to do, exactly what specification they're going to do, exactly the analysis, exactly the data, before the next few waves of government labor market data are released. Let's just like be totally hands above the table about it. So they kind of came up with this idea on their own and said, this is the scientifically appropriate way to work in this field. So David Levine and Alan Kruger did it. They brought in David Newmark. And the idea was that Kruger Card, Newmark, and co-authors would sort of agree on a, 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 a statistical approach and the data they would use, and then would kind of like generate the estimates together. That was the idea before getting any of the data. So this is what new, you know, this is what's sort of written up by Newmark, where he kind of describes what he did. You know, we're going to pre-specify the design. We're going to subject it to peer review beforehand to make sure that like expert researchers in the field agree this is the right way to test this. And then we're going to carry it out when the data becomes available. And this should allow us to eliminate what they call author effects. Author effects means kind of like researcher bias in the estimates. So very, this is 20, you know, this is 1997. So this was 20 years ago. No one was talking about this. But somehow the scientific method like burst through the, you know, through the fog. It's very similar to the idea that Danny, Danny Kahneman, I guess some people are familiar you know, with him. He's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, was a He's a psychologist by training, uh, but, but is an expert, a leader in the field of psychology and economics. He was here at Berkeley at the time, too. So this is all kind of mixed together. And David Levine said he used to talk to Danny Kahneman all the time about this notion of adversarial collaboration. Getting people with different results who are on different sides of a literature together and saying, we agree this is the right way to proceed scientifically, and we're going to co-author a paper. That's actually what Danny Kahneman has done apparently on a bunch of projects. He'll reach out to his most bitter adversary in the field and say, you know what, let's, let's agree. Let's sit down, do the experiment together, and, and make scientific progress. So this is, this is great. And this was the goal of the industrial relations pre-specification. It's also very close to what is now called the registered report, which is what, what I was mentioning briefly before. So this is an article format that has become common just in the last few years in a number of psychology journals, some scientific journals. Uh, one political science journal, Comparative Political Studies, did a special issue where, again, folks submit their plan, their research design, their data. It gets peer reviewed. And then it gets what's called in principle acceptance, IPA. And in principle acceptance is sort of like getting a revise and resubmit for a journal from a regular standard paper in that they're like, you know what? This sounds great. If you can actually get this data and you do what you say you're going to do, we'll, we'll publish it. Obviously, if like, the data collection falls apart, or you like, don't do the analysis the way you say you would, or you don't write it up, then they're not going to publish it. But, so that's the idea behind a registered report. Effectively, what, what the Industrial Relations Journal did was a registered report. Peer review, then get the data. We, we commit to publishing it as long as you, you, you do what you say you were going to do. So this is just a kind of schematic of what, what publishing you know, would look like, both the standard model and this new kind of registered reports model. You know, the usual model is we design a study, we go get the data, we analyze it, we write it up. And then we decide whether or not to submit it. If it gets submitted, it goes under peer review. Maybe the editor asks us to modify it. Maybe we edit it. Eventually, maybe it gets published. There's problems all along the way here, mainly at that writing up and submitting stage. So you know, we talked about the Franco et al. paper before. People collect data. They plan to, to get something published. But for some reason, they don't like the results. There are null results. The results don't conform with the priors of others in their discipline. This evidence disappears into the ether. So you, know, you may never even get to that publishing stage with the traditional model. With the results-blind review, 
you do all the design stuff, all the heavy lifting, all the conceptual work, all the literature review, all the planning up front, and you submit it to peer review. And if it's a good enough idea, they give you in principle acceptance, then you go out and do all the work. There's a bunch of advantages to this. A huge advantage is getting lots of detailed feedback at a point where you can still improve the science. So this has a bunch of advantages, even beyond getting around the whole publication bias issue, which is a massive issue. So this is a new and very exciting way forward. Then you collect the data and you go through and hopefully you get the paper published. But the difference here is even if you get a null result, even if you get a surprising result, you're going to get published. Card and Kruger, I talked about their minimum wage work two minutes ago, collected a bunch of data in the 90s showing that minimum wage increases really didn't affect employment, as I mentioned. There was a lot of resistance in the economics profession to that finding. Neoclassical theory suggests when you raise wages, employment's going to going to fall. People were upset with them. They, they said they lost friends. There are people in the profession that, that wouldn't talk to them for years because they felt like they were traitors to their discipline, seriously. So if you have registered reports, you're kind of protected from that too. Like, hell, look, look, we can all agree on the design. There's just a zero here. Don't blame the messenger, right? People were afraid that those zeros were author effects, that they were biased, that they were left wing, that they were whatever. So. There's a lot of potential advantages to this, this sort of approach. How did it work out in the Newmark study? And this is you know, a terrible eye test for all of you that are not like right up here with me. I apologize. But basically, that arrow there is when the April 1997 Symposium for Industrial Relations took place. Newmark submits his pre-specification of analysis, and it's only a few months later that the data gets released. I mean, the US government just hadn't released the data. He couldn't have mined the data. So he, put, he said, I'm going to use the data that's going to be released later this year to study these, these things. He registered it, eventually it came out as a working paper, and then it got published in the journal in, in 2001. So it's basically a registered report, what they did. OK. So um, you know, I'm, I'm running out of time, so let me um, skip over this point. This point about the cost of pre-specification pre has a little bit to do with what I talked about before, about flexibility and exploration. So you know, you're kind of tying your hands. When you pre-specify, and if you kind of get the specification wrong, that's a problem. Um, but hopefully, if you do, you'll just admit you did and, and run a better specification, explain why. And I think if there's more and more pre-analysis plans and pre-specification, people will learn that you know one out of every three or four papers, there's an error in the plan. And we have to, we have to be flexible, uh, as long as we explain why. Newmark's point, which I think is important, is in cases where there's already a, a large body of literature, like the minimum wage study, this is a bit, a bit less of a concern. When people have been studying an issue for decades, they know all the data sets. They kind of know the econometric or statistical issues. You kind of know there's maybe a few choices you're going to make on the statistics, but it's pretty well established what you're going to do. So this highly politicized, widely studied issues are probably the best cases for registered reports. You get around any accusation or possibility of bias, and you really know what you're doing ex ante. Um, so this is sort of, you know, his, uh, he, he basically, you know, makes this point. In cases where there's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, past experience, we're not so concerned about it. In other areas, and I, the paper here, the Casey et al. paper that's, that's cited here was that Sierra Leone study I was alluding to before. We were doing work on the impacts of a government, uh, of, sorry, of a, yeah, a government assistance program to villages in Sierra Leone that attempted to build local institutions and social capital broadly defined. No one really knew what the right outcomes were uh, for that study. In our study, we have hundreds of outcomes, gender empowerment outcomes, voting outcomes, uh, meeting participation outcomes. There's just literally hundreds of outcomes that we designed in our surveys, because we really didn't know where to look or what to do. And in fact, when we wrote our pre-analysis plan, we made sure to get a lot of input from our government partners, because we wanted to make sure we were studying what they were interested in. So we had tons of outcomes. It was pretty exploratory. You know, the way we deal with it there is we group these outcomes into families, and we do multiple testing adjustments. We deal with the multiple inference problem formally, because we have so many tests um, in, that, in that case. But, but that's a, a, a case where pre-specification is useful for other purposes. It's a case where we really didn't know exactly what to study when we started, uh, started uh, the project. Again, when there's a lot of outcomes to look at, it opens up scope for lots of data mining. So, Pre-specification is still useful. Okay, so what did Newmark find? He did all this, 
He registered his plan. I will say that originally, Alan Kruger and David Card were meant to take part in the symposium, but they backed out. They didn't want to participate. I don't know all the reasons why. So it was just Newmark's study that went through the refereeing process. Newmark basically found zeros or small negative effects. He sort of found these effects that were neither the you know, positive or zeros nor the big negative effects. He kind of found this kind of like weak negative effect, kind of close to zero. It wasn't a very well-powered study as it turned out. So it wasn't like the definitive study. But it was kind of in the middle of the range of existing estimates. So in, on one level, that's kind of reassuring that when you can't mess around with the data, you kind of get something close to what you expect. A bunch of studies since then have sort of homed in on estimates in that range that he, that he found. So it was actually scientifically useful, um, but it was underpowered. So it wasn't the perfect design. Um, one thing that Newmark does, which I think everybody who pre-specifies work should always do, is everything that wasn't pre-specified in his paper, he denotes very clearly. It's like, oh, you know, here I didn't include a lag, or I should have included a lag defect. I'm going to do that. I'll show it to you both ways, but I really think this is the right way. So it, there's a, a clear, any deviation, whenever there's going to be pre-specification, it's very important any deviation from the plan is, is well documented. Or else, what's the point? Um, OK, so let me just um, move on again, because I only have a, a, few, more, um, a few more minutes. Um, again, the Newmark approach is very close to what we're calling registered reports. It's sort of a forgotten episode. I was at, I've been at a bunch of conferences where folks from the Center for Open Science and elsewhere are trumpeting this new article form. And, but there are some precedents for this approach. And I think the Newmark case is a really, a really interesting one. And my general view is there's just a ton of applications of this work. Again, new data releases, future policy changes, future elections. Um, and, and we should all think, if we're going to do this kind of work, you know, ask ourselves, why aren't we pre-registering our hypotheses? You know, if if uh, marijuana is going to become legal in California, we were talking about that before. Folks are working on that. If we know on a certain date there's going to be a law change, pre-register your hypothesis about what's going to happen to the price. I mean, it would make it so much more scientifically powerful if everybody knows there was no possibility of tendentious reporting. Yeah, in the back. Is the mic, do we still have the mic? Why are people doing this? I mean, it, it's, been, it's been a while. In my case, uh, Chris Chamber did, you know, like uh, have a cerebral cortex. Uh, sure. And, you know, it's it, been like three years they've had registered years. reports. And it's, it's still not happening, right? I mean, uh, it's, yeah. it's still absolutely not the mainstream. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, very, very few papers I've seen, uh, you know, are, have, have been pre-registered. Yeah. Uh, why, what is the social or, you know, whatever argument that, I mean, what, what's, what's the cause? What's the reason for that? We, we've, we've had endless debates about the issue of why it's not happening. I think I'll, I'll kind of answer it in two parts. One is it's starting to happen in the sense that, let's say for experiments in economics, in development economics, people register their papers now. They register a pre-analysis plan. It's almost ubiquitous. So in certain subfields, it's starting. And I think it's, that's how it's going to work. There are going to be networks where the norm shifts. Shifting the norm in the broader network isn't going to be one year's work. It's going to be many years' work. And then I'm going to get on the record here. We're being filmed. When it happens, it's going to happen very quickly, would be my guess. I think so. I mean, that would be my, my view. So I think with experiments in economics, it's starting to happen. A lot of people aren't even that aware of this stuff in the mainstream. I think there's, there's something of a generational issue. When I've talked to grad students and younger scholars, the kind of immediate median reaction is, that's cool. Like, I want to do that. I want to be part of that, that mission. I think for folks who, and I'm, I'm in the middle, because I, the first 10 years of my career, we weren't registering anything. And in fact, I'm just publishing a paper now where we have to put in and, and put in the footnote, because it's becoming the norm in my field to have a pre-analysis plan. I just wrote the footnote this morning saying, we did not register a pre-analysis plan because we did the data collection before anybody was doing it. We're sorry. You know, like, so I think there's going to be resistance among those who say, wait a minute, if, only, if this is the only type of good research, what about my last 20 years of research? So I think it will take time. I think it'll be generational. I will tell you just in 30 seconds or a minute at the end of this talk, in a couple minutes, what we're doing at BITS to try to speed it along. But um, I'm still hopeful. So let me, let me come to that. Let me come to that. OK. Um, I think we're supposed to go till around 2. I was going to get into another paper. Maybe I won't go into it. I'm going to make one point. There's a really nice paper, Del Rey et al. Um, it's co-authored with John 
Ioannidis, who maybe many people know at Stanford, you know, eminent scholar, medical researcher, and scholar of transparency, um, where they make the case not just for registering prospective observational studies, which is the point of my lecture today, but for registering all observational studies. And um, non so in other words, the question is, is it desirable to register non-experimental, non-prospective observational studies? They say yes, and they give a bunch of arguments why. I'm not going to go into all of them because I, you know, I know we want to get to the question and answer. I will say one thing, though. They raise a concern about this approach, which I feel very strongly, and which makes me reluctant. Even though I'm, you know, I'm heading up bits and I'm pushing for transparency as much as I can, I'm pretty reluctant to support registering non-prospective studies. And I'll tell you why. Let me just jump ahead to, um, to this concern. When there's pre-existing data that's out there, like tons of data that I could have had access to already, it's basically impossible for me to credibly validate my claim that I'm registering these hypotheses before seeing the data. And it would be all too easy to mine the data, go in, register the hypotheses that I like, that work, that correlate properly, and publish something and say, oh, it's pre-registered. Look, my p-values are right. Ioannidis and Del Rey's response in their piece, and it's a, it's a very nicely argued piece, is, you know what? Norms will change. You know, researchers fundamentally are ethical. They won't want to do that. Um, they're going to, you know, a norm will emerge where before you touch any data, you're going to register your, hypothes your hypotheses. They may be right. I could be wrong. I just think it's all too easy for somebody to peek. And so I'm going to look just for 15 minutes. Like, I, I don't know if that variable is even clean enough to you. I don't know if, what the distribution. Maybe it's bimodal. Maybe you, know, you could imagine a bunch of reasons why people, actually, what is the correlation? Oh, that's it. It's no longer pre-registered at that point. So I think there's a concern with non-prospective work that even though it could be useful to register these studies, and they raise a bunch of issues about why it would be very useful, and maybe we should encourage it just to start the process and see if they're right, that it'll become a norm. My fear is it'll undermine the credibility of all the other registrations that are out there. So with experiments, with prospective non-experimental studies, you can pretty credibly know someone isn't data mining. You pretty much know what the p-values mean. We haven't even gotten there yet. If we try to go this far, people say, you know, this registration stuff's just all a scam because my friend was looking at the data before he registered his hypotheses. So I don't think we're ready for this yet. Maybe someday, but I'm, I'm a bit skeptical. Okay, let me, let me wrap up, and I, I won't get into the details on this paper. Um, all I want to do is just put up a, a slide on, on our initiative here, which in some ways is like a sister initiative with bids. And Kevin and I were just talking before, and we determined that bids and bits, in addition to having a brilliant, brilliant names, um, were founded in exactly the same month. Because you know? I think he was kind of like, you know, what, who came first? Which name came first? You know? So I think it's been exactly three and a half years. <laughs> and so, uh, so what do we do at bits? And this gets to the question of the gentleman who, you know, who asked before. BITS has training courses and workshops. There's going to be a summer institute here at Berkeley. We've had a few already. We've done a bunch internationally to teach people about these approaches, how to use pre-analysis plans, do replication, et cetera, do meta-analysis, other tools in this, in this area. We have a great bunch of online pedagogical materials and how-to guides. I'd really recommend you look at the website. Uh, there's a lot of slide decks. There's a lot of lectures, videos on all these topics. It'd be great if you're teaching a class, you want to give a, you know, bring in one lecture, half a lecture on these topics. There's like off-the-shelf materials here to use. We have grant competitions to fund research on transparency, repli rep replicability, meta-research. We've also just started this past year to award prizes. We, we were you know, very generously funded by the Templeton Foundation to, to award prizes to young leaders in the field, the young leaders who are really pushing the envelope on these topics. Um, and we're also creating, and this may be really valuable for people in this room, we're creating what we call the Bits Catalyst Network. And I think we have like 30 catalysts so far. Catalysts are folks who make the case in like a one pager why they're interested in transparency and reproducibility, why this is part of their workflow, why this is part of their intellectual agenda. And then they're eligible to apply for several thousand dollars to hold a workshop, to fly a speaker into their class. Basically, it's just seed money to do work you want to do in this area. And it could be to hire an RA. So, um, just there's a, a bunch of stuff going on in this area. And I think between bids being here on campus and bits, you know, we're coming from different disciplines mainly, although there's some overlap. Um, 
Uh, I think we're indicative of the fact that the movement has momentum right now and people are viewing data and viewing uh, reproducibility and transparency differently than they did 10 years ago, five years ago. Thanks. Sure, yeah, it's fine. There's an issue that I, I didn't hear you mention at all, which is if, if you're going to publish exactly what you're going to do, how are you going to do it, well, what's to prevent somebody else from doing, yeah. doing the work? Or, or would that actually be a good thing? Because then you don't have to do it, but you get a lot of the credit for having thought of the idea in the first place. Yeah, I skipped over that. I made a strategic decision. I, I think I have two bullet points in there. Let me, let me mention how it works. Both the AEA registry and the open science framework allow you to timestamp a document, a pre-analysis plan, et cetera, but not make it public right away. But not make it public right away. So they have a window of privacy. And I forget if it's three years, something like that. So there's a pretty decent window. And again, I think the idea there is they don't want people not to post because they're afraid of getting scooped. Um, and so that's actually, that, that could pr provide some protection. So you have at least a few years to get your research out. Now in terms of some of these, like what I was talking about, the Dalray, the observational registries and whatnot, um, again, if, if you don't have that kind of timestamp and the data is available, like if I'm running a $5 million experiment in Sierra Leone and I've got the grant and the, I'm working with the government, hell, I can post that online. Like no one's going to redo my project. I mean, it's like a unique project. But if it's an existing data set that anybody can download in 30 seconds, I'm really concerned about scooping there. So any of these proposals for observational study registries would have to give people some kind of grace period after which it becomes public, right? Um, so there's another fear there, which is almost like patent trolling, which is like people could post 500 things. And then anytime anybody works on any topic related to their 500 hypotheses, they would claim credit for it. And maybe, maybe they should. Maybe they shouldn't. It's just really different than the way research credit is allocated right now. It would be a really different model. So, and you hinted at that with your point. Like if I post it and someone else does it, maybe I get credit. So um, it's another reason why some of the kind of perspective, the non-perspective observational study registration would it face challenges, I think. We'd have to figure a lot of stuff out. Thanks a lot.